Welcome to Sligo Church. us live or you found us online. We thank you for being a part of our worship today. Good morning once again and happy Sabbath. It is a delight to be in the house of the Lord. And the psalm it says, praise the Lord at all times for his mercy endures forever. And as we are here today, um, I, I read something this morning that said, praise is the life of our walk with Christ. I invite you to join us in praise for songs of gathering. The words will be on the screen. And please join us in singing, harmonizing, and just let God know how you're feeling this morning. I don't know what you went through last night, but guess what? The weeping may last all night, but joy comes in the morning. Please join us as we praise our God together.
from our house to your house and anywhere in between. Welcome to Sligo Church Live. Online and mobile at sligochurch.com. Good morning and welcome to Sligo Live. I'm Jean Arthur and today we're going to be talking about scholarshipping our sisters. I know it's hard to get it off the tongue. And with me is Raquel Arias. Is, did I pronounce that right? Raquel Ahais. Okay. <laughs> you heard her. And she's the Associate Director of Women's Ministries right. at the World Church at the General Conference. And you know, studies have shown that when women are educated, they have the whole community benefits. Yes. The, they have, the community has a greater chance, people in the community of, escape, of escaping poverty, they have a bigger opportunity to get their Correct. children out of poverty. And in, in essence, the whole community benefits when women are educated and empowered. Correct. So in 1991, mm -hmm. the General Conference, the Women's Ministers Division, started this program called Scholarship in Our Sisters. So tell us what that is. Tell us about Scholarship in Our Sisters. It was a beautiful vision. When Rosie Otts, our first Women's Ministers Director, came to the General Conference, she thought about something that could help women to leave the six issues, the, the, the five issues that impact women globally behind, mm -hmm. having education as uh, the heart of the department. Right. So if you take the six issues, workload, illiteracy, abuse and violence, um, uh, uh, health, mm -hmm and also education. Right. She said, education is the key yes. to give a better life to women because as you said, if we educate a woman, she has a better approach to life. Yes. Not only for herself, but for her family, community, church, and she also is, will be able to help and educate another woman. Right. So in 1991, we started a general conference, Women's Ministries Scholarship Fund that operates up to now. So, and we know that from our own, own experience that education is very expensive. It is. And it's a great barrier for so many people, uh, especially in certain communities. But mm -hmm. it, it's, money is a barrier that sometimes prevents people from actually getting educated. So how does the scholarship fund help? How, who can apply? Where does the money come from? Tell us more, a little bit more about the fund. Yeah, I would like to say thank you to you, Jean, and also the women from Miss Ligo Church, especially Carolyn Kuyawa and Dr. Jean Arthur and her team for creating a chapter here, right here, to help women to receive a scholarship globally. But in 2004, we received a group of volunteers at the General Conference, led by Carolyn Cuyao and Sister Heather Donny Small, our director, mm -hmm. that they came together with an idea to have a group of volunteers working on projects, mm -hmm. working on raising more funds to support the scholarship mm -hmm. fund. So up to 2004, up to now, we have the scholarship in our sisters that is under the umbrella of the General Conference Scholarship Fund. Mm -hmm. So how women can apply? Any woman planning to attend uh, one of our institutions uh, where she lives is invited to apply. Okay. You go through our website mm -hmm. and then we have AdventistWomensMinist.org mm -hmm. and you have the application right there mm -hmm. available for you. So this is globally. We have been given a scholarship over the years. Mm -hmm. And I think the first woman who received the first scholarship, you know her, yes. is Sister May Ellen Colomb. Yes. She works at the General Conference, but this was the beginning of a vision from Sister Rosie Otts that can, that if up today is a fund that is alive and a fund that is making a difference to women's lives globally. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time, and there's so much more that we can talk about. But the important thing to learn here is that if you are interested in educating women, there are ways that you can give. You can go to the 
Sligo's online giving, there's a line there called Scholarship in Our Sisters. You can write a check to Adventist, to the Women's Ministries Ministries? Division, or you can put it in the offering plate with a memo, Women Ministries Division. So thank you so much for listening, and I hope that you will ask one of us, if you see me or Carolyn Kiawa, ask us about Scholarship in Our Sisters. And now we'll go to our regular programming, which is our, ser- which is our church service in which Pastor Tapp is going to be talking on a topic called God versus Money, a Battle for the Heart. Good morning, church family, and welcome to Sligo Church. We welcome our regular church family that is here with us. We welcome those that are worshiping online. We're so glad that you have joined us. We also welcome those that may be first time guests to Sligo Church. Thank you for being here. We trust that you'll be truly blessed by worshiping God together. In Psalms chapter 42, verse 2, it says, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? If you've come thirsty here this morning, we have a God that promises He is the living water. Amen and that he will quench our thirst. And we pray that that's what you will experience as we're here together. I also do want to welcome the Adventist Children's Chorus. Don't they look amazing? We look forward to hearing them as they worship through song, and we're glad that they are here. I invite you at this time to turn to your bulletins. We have a number of announcements that you would uh, want to be aware of. Firstly... Homecoming. Homecoming. Only 10 weeks away to homecoming. And this is a time where we get to celebrate the wonderful diversity that we have here at Sligo Church. We get to celebrate through many ways. One way I love celebrating is not only through the Parade of Nations, but also through our international potluck. Amen? where we get to taste the fine cuisines from all over the world. So don't forget, save the date. The first Sabbath in August is homecoming. Also, you want to keep in mind a special program that is sponsored by Heartlifters. It is called Rebuilding Faith After Loss. There are some in our congregations that are experiencing loss of a loved one. And we want to know, how can we rebuild our faith in the midst of pain? Come on next week, Sabbath, May 25th at 1.15 p.m., and experience how we can rebuild our strength in God, even in the midst of our struggle. There will be a potluck at 1.15 p.m., so feel free to bring your favorite dish. And at 2.15 p.m., there will be a special presentation. Also, Vocation Bible School is also coming up, and you have the opportunity to register for Vocation Bible School as a volunteer. If you look in your insert there, you will find details of the website where you can register as a volunteer. This is one of the most significant evangelistic opportunities that we have as a church where we get to share with young people the love of Jesus Christ where hundreds of children come to Sligo Church for a week and learn about God and His plan for their lives. So if you want to be part of this special uh, program that we have here, please volunteer. Really, the program is here for not only children, but as volunteers, you are the backbone of this program. So feel free to register there on the website, and you'll see the details in your insert. At this time, we have the opportunity to also greet one another, those beside us, in front of us, and behind us. So feel free at this time to greet each other, wish wish each other a, a happy Sabbath, and let's embrace each other with a warm handshake. Let's do that at this time, or embrace. Let's do that.
whether you feel officially welcomed. Next week here at Sligo, we will be joining the Tacoma Academy Preparatory School for their special baccalaureate service. So feel free to join us here at Sligo as we celebrate what God is doing through the accomplishments of our eighth grade students at Tacoma Academy Preparatory School. Please remember in your prayers those that are seeking pre uh, comfort and healing. We want to remember those of families of the deceased, Edith Frazier, E.G. Moses, and Joan Boyack, also for healing, Margie Loveless and Tom Prasada Rayo, and not mentioned in your bulletin, but uh, families that we do want to keep in mind is the Temenko family. Natalia was just had surgery, I believe, today, and her surgery is, is over, but she is in recovery. She is the daughter of Carrie and Derek, so please keep Natalia in prayer. And also Devorah Guerrero, please keep her in prayer as well. I invite you at this time to bow your heads with me in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we come this morning seeking your presence. You promise that when we abide in you, we will bear much fruit. So, Lord, we come to abide in you this morning. We come seeking a special blessing from you, dear Lord. We come recognizing that we will never be filled until we are filled by you. Therefore, dear Lord, we pray that we will not leave your presence until we are full of the assurance, knowing that you love us and deeply care for us, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Therefore, dear Lord, we come asking that you bless us this morning with your presence, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of praise is Crown Him with Many Crowns, number 223 in your hymnals. Would you please stand as we sing together?
I invite you all to kneel wherever possible as we seek the Lord in prayer. Dear Jesus Christ, we humbly and joyfully come to you this morning to lift your name. We praise you, the one crowned with loving kindness and tender mercies. Blessed be your holy name. We invite your presence to fill this place as we honor your name simply for who you are. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for the things we have done that make us feel uncomfortable in your presence. All the front that we polish so carefully for men to see does not deceive you. For you know every thought that has left its shadow on our memory. We acknowledge with bitterness and true repentance the selfish thoughts that have entered our minds. We acknowledge that we have permitted our minds to wander through unclean and forbidden ways. We have toyed with things that we knew were not for us, and we have desired things we should not have. We confess before you that our ears are often deaf to the whisper of your call, and our eyes are often blind to the signs of your guidance. Forgive our sins, Lord, and make us willing to change, even though it requires discipline we lack. Father, I humbly ask that you watch over those who worry or weep, console their spirits, and ease their minds with the promises you have made. Give your angels charge over those who are not here. Tend to all those who are sick, tired, and battered. Soothe those who are suffering with an illness or a loss of any kind. Continue to bless our members watching online, as well as those currently here, and protect all those on their way and those unable to join us. Be with Pastor Tapp as he delivers your message today. May he impart your love and wisdom through his words. May our hearts, make our hearts warm and soft as we may receive now the blessing you have prepared for us. Father, thank you for bringing us into your family. May we never disappoint you in the way we treat others. May they see in us the qualities of character that can only be attributed to you. Thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for listening to us, even when we are undeserving. And thank you for meeting every single one of our needs. To you be the glory and the honor forever. In Jesus' name, amen.
It's always a privilege and a pleasure when we have opportunity to bring a young child and dedicate them to the Lord. So I'm going to ask Carrie and Francis if you're here to bring your little one to the Lord. I don't think I've seen you. If you're here, just wave. If you're worshiping online, we're in trouble. <laughs> hmm? Are you here? If not, let's just go to our children's story. We're going to invite Auntie Dana to come. She has a special message for our children this morning. And as you're coming, we're going to ask the parents and all the adults who have money for our children's ministry to just raise it high, put it in your hand, raise it high, wave it so that our children can see it. And they will be more than happy to take it from you and place it into the baskets. Auntie Dana has a very special story for you today. Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning. I actually have two stories I'm going to tell you today, and they are both true. And do you know how I know they're true? Well, one of them is true because it happened to me, and the other one I know is true because it's in the Bible. I'm going to start with the one that's in the, that was in the Bible first, okay? So, there was a woman, and her husband had died, and she had two sons, and she owed somebody a lot of money. And she went to the prophet Elisha, and she said, what am I going to do? The man that I owe money to is going to come and take my sons because I owe him a lot of money. What do I do? And Elisha told her to do something, and it was a miracle. Well, Elisha told her to go and ask her neighbors for all the pots that they had. And so she went, and she asked her neighbors for all the pots. And then he said, I want you to take your little jar of olive oil and start filling up all the other jars. Do you remember this story now? Well, she went and she started filling, and she just had a little tiny jar. But she started filling, and it filled jar after jar after jar. And she kept telling her sons, bring me another jar, bring me another jar. And they would. And then she said, bring me another jar. And, she said, and the boys said to her, we don't have any more. And then there was no more oil left in her little jar for her to keep pouring. And so she took all those jars of olive oil and she sold them. And then she was able to pay her debt. Isn't that amazing how God provided for her? 
now. A lot of times we think, well, that was in the Bible. That kind of stuff doesn't happen today. But guess what? I'm going to tell you a story about how God provided for me. When I was in high school, I think I was a freshman, my dad was a construction worker, and he hung drywall. Do you know what drywall is? It's like the stuff that we put on the walls after the boards to form the walls. And it was really, really big. So can somebody help me? Because I want to show you how big it was. Can somebody help me? Can you come help me? Come stand over here. You stand right here. Okay, I want you to hold this for me, okay? So the drywall that he would hang was really, 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 really big. It was even longer than this, another about two feet longer, so about this long. And can you hold it up a little bit higher? A little higher? And about that tall. And sometimes he would work by himself. So do you think he had to be really, really strong to be able to lift up those big boards like that? Do you think he had to be strong? Yeah, he had to be really strong. And so one day he was working and he had his partner with him that day. He was working with someone else and they were up high on this stuff called scaffolding that he, so that, you know, like over here, can you imagine? Could you stand on the floor and fix the wall way up there at the top? Of course not, it's way too high. And so he was standing on top of this scaffolding and he fell down and he broke his arm. Now, if you had a broken arm, do you think you could lift those big heavy boards anymore? No, he couldn't. But you know what? I was in school. I was at Blue Mountain Academy at that time. I was a freshman and we had to pay a lot of money to be able to go there. Well, guess what? When my dad broke his arm, do you think he could work anymore? No, he couldn't work anymore. We didn't know what we were going to do because we didn't have money then to pay for my school. Well, you know what? The school asked some families and those families helped us to pay for school so that I could still go to school. Isn't that amazing how God provides for us? Yes, in the Bible, in Ephesians 3 verse 20, it says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. That tells us that God can provide for us even when we don't see how it's possible. Let's say prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for this day you've given us. Thank you for the Sabbath. Thank you that you promise to provide for all of our needs. We love you. Amen. You may go back to your seats. scripture reading today comes from Philippians chapter 4 verses 10 through 13. This is a responsive scripture reading where I'll be reading the leader portion and Pastor Joseph will be reading along with you with the congregation. It can be found in your bulletin or on the screens. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed you were concerned before but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from once for I am to be content. In whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
Say amen again. Thank you, Adventist Children's Choir from Spencerville for your beautiful music this morning as well as our Sligo singers. Good morning, family. Oh, I think you can do better than that. It was supposed to rain today. Maybe it still will, but it's not doing it now, so let's try it again. Good morning, family. Good morning. I want to take this opportunity to welcome those of you who are worshiping online with us today. Always a pleasure to have you with us. And those of you who are here worshiping today for the very first time, we want to know who you are. If you just look in your bulletin, you'll see an insert that simply says guest connection card. If you will fill that out and when the offering basket comes around, just place it in there. And next week, we're going to send you something in the mail, just our way of saying thank you for being here at Sligo Church for the very first time. In about 10 weeks, as Pastor Kabaz mentioned, homecoming is going to take place. Please put that date on your calendar, August 3rd, 19, not 19, 2019, Woo. 2019. For more information, just go to the website, sligochurch.org. And today at the end of the service, all of our children who are ready to plant flowers again like we did last year. We planted the uh, sunflowers on last year, and that went over so well. If you would like another pack of sunflower seeds to put in the garden, now you've got to take them home to your parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, and get some help. But if you would like a packet, only one per family, please see me after today's service. And all I ask is that you plant it. Oh, you want to get a picture of that? Okay. All right. All I ask is that you take it home and plant it, water it, and when it starts to grow, take pictures of it and send it to me or bring it to me and let me see it, and we'll show it on our website and we'll show the family during the worship service. So don't everybody come running to me. And adults, this is not for you. 
unless you have children. Is that all right? All right, God bless you. Today we're concluding a series of messages we began a few weeks ago that we've titled God versus Money as we look at the battle for the heart. And I've titled this last message in this series simply, Till Debt Do Us Part. Let that sink in for a moment. Till Debt Do Us Part. Let's pray together. Father God, Lord, we thank you for the blessings of this day. Having brought us safely through yet another week, Lord, we dare not take it for granted that we are here in the house of prayer today. And Father, as we pause now to hear a word from you, as always, we ask that you open our hearts, that you clear our minds of all the clutter that has accumulated over this past week, and that you grant us the understanding that is needed. And Father, may every individual under the sound of my voice today receive the blessing that each of us stands so desperately in need of in spite of this flawed, defective vessel you have chosen to use. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today, as we conclude our series, God versus Money, a battle for the heart, I want us to revisit a passage of Scripture that we looked at at the beginning of this series. So turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6 as we look at verses 19 to verse 21. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21. As Jesus begins to share here right in the middle of his Sermon on the Mount, look at what he says. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves, what? Treasures in heaven. It sounds like Jesus doesn't have a problem with you and me having treasure. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Verse 21. For where your treasure is, Jesus says, there your heart will be also. Please do not miss what Jesus is saying and the message that he is trying to convey here. And first of all, it is simply this, that the treasure he's talking about is what you and I decide to place the greatest value or worth in and that which we pay the most attention to in our lives. And he's giving us a warning here. And that warning is simply this, that these treasures, the things that we place in an ordinate matter of, of value in, those things that are exposed to the element and can be destroyed like by rust or by moth, don't place your value in those things. And don't place your value, don't make treasure something that can be stolen something that can be robbed. You know, theft today is not what it was 30 years ago. If someone wanted to steal from you 30 years ago, they had to come where you physically are and take it from you. Today, people can rob you blind. They can empty your bank account without ever leaving their home. Jesus says, don't place value in those things that people can steal, that the elements can ultimately destroy. And then he says, here's the reason why. For where your treasure is, your heart will be there as well. Meaning, if you want to know where a person's heart is, if you want to know where their affection lies, if you want to know what they're truly devoted to, look at the things in their lives that they place the greatest value in. So as I said in part one of our series, as Christians, our hearts, our devotion, and our affection, Jesus says, 
is not to be tied up in the things of this world. As a matter of fact, in John 17, Jesus says, listen, you can be in the world geographically present, physically here, but please do not be of the world. And by of the world, the message that Jesus is giving here, don't allow the value system, don't allow the ideology of the world, of the culture, to permeate your life and to take hold of you. In other words, in this world, we're not supposed to be going with the stream of the culture. We're supposed to be going against the stream of the culture. But as I said this morning in the 845 service, too many of us as Christians today are playing undercover Christian. You ever watch the program Undercover Boss? Isn't that a great show? I think personally that they already know what's going on. That's, that's, that's just me. But many of us are pretending, trying to be undercover with our Christianity, and we're going with the flow of society, going with the culture, so they don't know whether we are Christian or not. Jesus says, yes, I want you to be geographically, physically in the world. But when it comes to the ideology, when it comes to the culture of this age, I want you to be going in the opposite direction. Better yet, in Matthew 5, Jesus says, I want you to transform the culture like salt and light is transformational. That's what Jesus is asking of us. In the previous message of this series where I titled it to covet, or not to covet, we address the final and tenth commandment, which warns us against the sin of coveting. And to define coveting, I gave you a definition. I'm going to give it to you again, and it is simply this. The sin of covetousness means desiring something other than God in the wrong way. And if you remember, I, I said to you, in the wrong way means to do so negatively to the point where it can negatively impact not only your relationship with God, but it can also negatively impact your relationship with each other. And the classic case of this we find in the book of Genesis with our first parents, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden. For here is where the sin of covetousness raises its ugly head. And again, to covet something doesn't mean that you just have a desire or a craving for it. A couple of weeks ago, when I shared this message, I told you I have a craving for what? Potato chips. That's right. Not just any potato chips, but barbecue potato chips that are ripples. I got to be careful what I say from this pulpit. For just a few days later in my office, was delivered by FedEx. I can't make this up. I should have taken a picture so I could show you. Was a case of potato chips. Barbecue. Somebody said, amen. Rippled. I couldn't believe it. And the note said, just like your sermons ripple through the culture, now you can ripple on these potato chips. And I was saying, amen to that. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how many are left. I'm not going to confess this morning. Amen? Amen? That's not what Jesus is talking about. To covet something means that you're giving it your allegiance. You're giving it your devotion. You're giving it your worship. And in doing so, we are shifting our allegiance from God to that thing. And by doing that, we are breaking the first commandment which says you shall have no other gods before me. Because when you and I shift allegiance that only God should have and place it on something else in our lives, the Bible says that is committing the sin of idolatry. Look what the Apostle Paul says in relationship to that in Colossians chapter 3 and, and verse 5. Look at what he says. He says, therefore... Put to death what? Your members which are on the earth. He lists them. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire. And look at this. 
and covetousness, which is what? Which is idolatry. And the sin of covetousness is so pervasive in our culture today that believe it or not, it helps to drive our economy and to boost the GNP, the gross national product. Advertisers' job is to convince you, to convince me to buy things that we do not need, things that we don't necessarily like, and many times things which we really cannot afford to buy. And they do such a good job of of persuading and convincing us to acquire these goods and services, even if it means that we have to go outside of our financial means to acquire them, a.k.a. getting into debt. Ouch. Did you know last year, 80% of Americans are in debt based on last year's figures. 80% of Americans are in debt. And if you're a millennial and you went to college, 81% of you are in debt. Some of your debt is bigger than some mortgages. That is why many a millennial after graduating and even getting a job, has to go back home and live with their parents. Did you know that one day you may have to go back home? (laughs) This guy's going, are you kidding me? (laughs) Sometimes that's not always a bad thing. But a lot of it has to do with the fact that we have so much debt. And for millennials, The defining characteristic of their generation is just that, being in debt. Did you know that the figures from the Federal Reserve tell us that the average American household is in debt to the tune of $137,000 and that the median income is only $53,000? which means most of Americans are in debt three times of what they bring in. You know, I performed many weddings in nearly four years of pastoring, and and, and most of what I say in the ceremony, the bride and groom don't ever remember, except for these three things. The first of which is when I turned to the congregation and said, if there's anyone here today that has just cause as to why this couple shall not be married, let them speak now or forever hold their peace. It gets very quiet, just like it did just now. And some couples will say to me, Pastor, can you omit that? Can you eliminate that part? And surely they don't miss hearing the part when I say, and now you can turn and kiss your bride. I was doing a wedding many years ago, and we got to that point of the service, and I turned to the groom, and I said, and now you can kiss your bride. And as he reached in, and I can't make this up. When I retire, my first book is going to be titled, I Can't Make This Up. (laughs) When I said to him, you can now kiss your bride, he reached in to kiss her, and she turned away from him. That's what all you young ladies should do right here if a guy tries to kiss you <laughs> right now. Just, just turn away from him. Promise? Okay. So it kind of caught me off guard. So I said, maybe she didn't hear what I said. So I said it a second time. You may now kiss your bride. And the groom was ready. He was eager. So he stepped forward and leaned in and she went, So I said, I'm going to give it one more chance. And I said, now you may salute your bride. And he reached in for a third time, and she went. I said, wow. Can you imagine how that marriage turned out? But when I think about that one line, 
in the ceremony that says, till death do you part? I think that's the most sobering of all because it, it has a sense of forever. But many of us are that way when it comes to our debt. In other words, we will not get rid of our debt until we die. Till debt do us part. Oh, pastor, you don't know what you're talking about. Really? The latest statistics tell us that 73% of us will die with our debt. And the only way we can be separated from it is if we die. Till debt do us part. But should we as Christians live that way? Is that the way that God expects us to live? Is financial indebtedness something that God smiles on? And if not, then shouldn't it behoove us as believers to begin to exercise even greater wisdom when it comes to acquiring indebtedness, and I mean indebtedness of any kind? Because what happens with, when we get debt, it, it helps to destroy our current peace, but it also helps to destroy our future blessings. As we know, the Bible has a great deal to say about money. As a matter of fact, most of the parables that Jesus told in the Gospels were on the topic of money. But the Bible also has a lot to say about this topic of debt. And there are a couple of misconceptions I want to share with you this morning as it relates to how God views debt. And the first is this. There are many who believe that the Bible says that debt is a sin but nothing could be further from the truth. And although God's Word does warn us about the potential dangers of debt, debt itself is not a sin. But what can make debt a sin is the reason or the thing that motivates you and me to get into debt in the first place. Because once you and I get into debt, it ultimately will impact our lives for a very long time. For instance, in Proverbs 22 and verse 7, it says that, that when you get into debt, we are entering a slave-master relationship with our creditors. And you know that's true. As I was telling the congregation this morning in the first service, when my check comes in, because it comes in automatic deposit, that's the happiest time of the month. That's when I see the largest balance in my checking account. And doesn't it make you feel good when you look at that? How many days later is most of that money gone? And then you're waiting for next month so that you can have that feeling, what? All over again. Because you and I, notice I said you and I, us, you and me, we are slaves to our creditors. And if you don't believe me, try not paying the bill. Don't pay the bill to that car. That miss, miss a couple of car payments. And unless you have a garage which hides your car, you leave it in the driveway, it'll be gone. I'll never forget, I was pastoring in New York and I was thinking about buying a car from a friend of mine who was another pastor whose name I will not mention. He has since asked for forgiveness. But he loaned me his car so I could test it out. And I, and I drove it to a funeral at my church. Again, I cannot make this stuff up. As I'm leaving the church, I'm seeing them take the car and they've got it connected to the tow truck and they're about to pull off. And I'm going, what are you doing? He said, listen, there's so many tickets on this car, you have no idea. I said, but it's not my car. He says, I don't care. I'm taking it. And the woman whose husband I just funeralized said to, said to the driver, how much, what's the fine for all these tickets? He told her. She reached into her purse, pulled out cash, the amount of money to give to the tow truck driver and I was able to drive home. And as soon as I got home, I picked up my phone. Those are the days before we had cell phones. 
and I let my friend have it. He has since begged my forgiveness. When you and I are in debt, we are in slavery. Psalm 37, 21 says that the wicked borrows but does not pay back, but the righteous is generous and gives. And what the psalmist is saying here, that if you're righteous, if you have a debt, you are obligated to pay it back. And Ecclesiastes 5, 4 reminds us by saying, it is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it, to not keep your promise. Another misconception that we have as it relates to debt is that it's, it's a sin to loan people money. And this is important because once you loan someone money, especially a friend, inevitably your relationship with that person changes forever. Look at the proverb that's, that's in your bulletin today. It's also on your sermon review. Look at what it says here. Do you have it? Look at what it says. Can you put it up on the screen for us? It says, before borrowing money from a friend, decide which you need most. Amen? Before borrowing money from a friend, decide which you need most. Although the Bible clearly does not classify debt as a sin, if we're going to be brutally honest with ourselves today, much of the debt that many of us have incurred, including many Christians, is the direct result of the sin of covetousness which has taken root in our hearts. And as I said earlier, it's God versus money, a battle for our hearts. And the reason why so many of us have given in to the seduction of stuff is because we have not learned or refused to learn to live within our means. I knew today was going to be quiet. We have not learned, as Paul says, the secret of contentment. Look at what he says in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through verse 13. Look at what he says. He says, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Paul is thanking here the believers at Philippi because he's in prison for all the times they sent care packages and took care of him. But he also recognized there were times they weren't able to do so. And Paul says, I understand that. And I'm not bringing this up because I really want you to do something now. I'm just letting you know how much I appreciate what you have done in the past. Amen? He's not trying to put a guilt trip on him. Then he says in verse 11, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have, what, learned in whatever state I am to be, what, content. Look at verse 12. I know how to be, what, abased, meaning living with little, and I know how to abound, having much. He says, everywhere and in how many things? All things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Now look at verse 13, which I look at as being one of the most distorted texts in all of Scripture. Paul says, based on what I just told you, I can do how many things? All things through Christ who strengthens me. And in the context of what Paul is talking about, he's saying, listen, there are times in my life I've had very little. Anybody relate to that? There are times in my life I have had very much. He says, I can do all things I have learned to do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Better translated, it would read like this. I can endure all things through Christ who gives me strength. Endure what? Endure the tough times and endure what? The good times. What do you mean endure the good times? 
Sometimes it's hard to have a lot. But I am thankful for those times in my life where I have had very little. Because it is in those times that I have learned some very valuable lessons. I have learned how to trust God. I have learned how to be patient, not in abundance, but in my lack. I told you as a young pastor, single growing up in New York, pastoring there, not having money, not having food, not having sometimes only water and Kool-Aid and no sugar to mix in the Kool-Aid. But God taught me patience. God taught me trust. And Paul is saying, I can endure all things for this reason, because my treasure, the thing that I value most, I have not put them in the things of this world, but the thing Paul says I value most is my relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? So whether in good times or in bad times, as long as my relationship with Jesus Christ is intact, I can endure. The best of times, I can endure the worst of times. How can we learn to trust God if we're always willing to mortgage our future by constantly getting into more and more and more debt. Look at this quotation by the psychologist, Dr. Joyce Brothers, and she talks about credit, credit buying. She says, credit buying is much like being drunk. I'm not gonna ask how many of you have ever been drunk, just, just keep reading. Credit buying is much like being what? Drunk. The buzz happens immediately, and it gives you what? A lift, but the hangover comes when? The day after, or the week after, or the month after when you get that bill and you see the interest charges. That is why I drive a 2005 Toyota Camry would have scratched in the front, front, front side with, I forgot how many thousand miles on that car, but it gets me from point A, amen, to point B, and from point B back to A, and every once in a while, it takes me other points as well. But you know what? At the end of the month, you know what I don't have? <laughs> I don't have a car payment. Somebody should have said amen to that. I do not have a car payment. As I told someone in the parking lot after the first service and they want to look at my car, I said to them, I'm going to drive this car till the last piece falls off. And then if I can't glue it together with crazy glue or monster gorilla glue, please, don't get me started now. Listen, there are times that you and I will have to be in debt. Emergencies happen. Trying to buy a house, you can't buy a house unless you're just, you know, wealthy like that. You have to get into debt. But here's the takeaway that I'm getting from what God's Word has to say in relationship to debt, and that is this, that as for the child of God, debt should not be a way of life. It should not be a way of life. It shouldn't be what we always do, always counting on the future to take care of what we've done in the present. The future is not guaranteed. If many of us lost our jobs right now, we would be on the street within a week. God is telling us, let's not make debt a way of life. For this country, the United States of America, debt is a way of life of life. But Jesus says to his followers, be in the world, 
but don't be of the world. So if you're like me, you're trying to pay off debt wherever you can. And I truly believe God honors that. Having said all that, there is an indebtedness that God expects and requires of all of us who desire to be part of the kingdom of God. Look at what Paul says. This is my last verse for this message today. Romans chapter 13 and verse 8. Romans 13 and verse 8. Paul says, Owe no one anything. Now, you would think Paul is saying don't borrow, but when you read verses 1 to 7, he's not saying that. He's saying if you do business with someone, if you have a loan with someone, make sure as a believer you pay it off. So when he says, owe no one anything, he's saying, make sure that if you owe something, pay it off. Amen? But then he says, except. Except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. In other words, Paul is saying, make sure you pay your debts in this life. But there's one debt you should never repay, and that is the debt of love that you have for your brothers and sisters. And I thought about that this morning. I began to ask myself, what is Paul really saying? Paul is saying this. You cannot pay that debt off because the love that you and I have for one another is a byproduct of the love that God has for us. And how many of you can pay God back for the debt of love you owe? Not a single one of us. Yes, there are times we will get into debt, but Paul said there's one debt I don't want you ever to try to pay off, and that is the debt of love. For when you and I love one another, we're showing the world how much God loves us. For Jesus says, and this is how they will know that you are one of mine, If you have what? Love one for the other. I knew when I got to this part of this series, it was going to be rough. I knew it. I knew it. And the reason why it's rough is because we live in this world, and many of us, yea, most of us, are in debt of some kind. But here's the counsel from God's word. Don't make debt a way of living. Don't make debt a lifestyle. Because in doing so, you rob yourself of the present peace and you also deny yourself of the future blessings. Not just blessings you can be to yourself, but a blessing that you can be to others. And ultimately, we deny ourselves the opportunity to be a blessing to the kingdom of God. God versus money. A battle for the heart. That's exactly what it is. It is the one thing in this world that has the strongest appeal and power over our hearts. But Jesus leaves us with these words. Don't make these things your treasure. For where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. And as believers, our hearts should be embedded in the hands of God and nowhere else. So I challenge each of us today to begin to examine our way of living because God wants to free us from slavery. And he who the Son sets free, finish it, will be free indeed. Who says amen to that today? Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you for this message today and for this five-part series where we've been examining the battle for the heart. God versus money. 
Father, many of us are in debt. We've made mistakes. We've made poor choices. But even now, at this very moment, you can convict us to begin a process to stop getting into more debt and begin to pay the current debt off. Lord, we know it's going to take time. It took time to get into debt. It's going to take time to get out of it. But if we trust and obey you, you will help us along the way. Father, I ask that your spirit today convict every heart that is in this sanctuary, those who are worshiping online, those who are listening by radio, those who are listening to the podcast. Convict us, O oh God, to live our lives in such a way that it puts a smile on your face. Get us out of slavery just like you deliver the children of Israel. Deliver us so that we can be in this world, but not of this world. Let these seeds that have been shared here today, O oh Father, seeds of truth be planted in our hearts. May they take root, and may they ultimately bear the fruit of your righteousness is our prayer. In Jesus' name. That all God's people say, amen. Today, as we prepare to receive the tithes and the offerings, it is our opportunity to help expand the kingdom of God. And as I say just about every week, when, when you and I choose to rob God of what he asks of us, we are robbing God of the opportunity to demonstrate just how faithful he can be in our lives when we trust him. So let's continue to bless the kingdom, expand it in this church, on our campus, in our community, and yes, throughout the world, for we will never know the impact of our faithfulness, of our giving, of our resources, until we reach heaven and see Jesus face to face. Reflection is Trust and Obey, number 590 in your hymnals. We will sing verses 1, 3, 4, and 5. Would you please stand as we sing together?
I failed to mention for those of you who are worshiping online with us this, uh, today, if you would like to help to expand the kingdom of God through your giving, just go to the website, sligochurch.org. Just click on the give icon and follow the prompts, and we thank you for what you're doing. And for our children, again, it's time to plant our sunflowers. So meet me at the door. Are you going to help me pass them out, Jeff? Maybe Jeff will help. Be my bodyguard, help pass them out. Come, and as many as I have, I will give to you, one per family. But you have to promise to take a picture when they grow. And parents, it says that they will reach 12 feet in height. I'm just giving you a warning. I don't know about you, folk, but the words of that hymn we just sung resonate with me. Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. They go hand in hand. So my prayer that is today that we will give God access not to just part of our lives, but all of our lives, and that means our finances as well. And allow God to demonstrate to us just how faithful he can be to those who trust and obey. If you would like to learn more about Sligo Church, how to become a disciple of Jesus Christ, or to just get involved in the ministry here today, following the benediction, Pastor Kabaz will be seated right here in the front. He'll be waiting with you and for you. Just come right on down, and he will pray with you and give you some instruction how you can get intricately involved in Sligo Church. If you'd like to learn more about the ministries as you leave today at the various exits in the atrium and in the North X, you will see our Sligo Ministry Journal. Just take one home with you and browse through it. And if you see something that sparks your, your curiosity, just reach out and let us know, and we'll make sure we connect you with that ministry. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for there's truly no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. And there is a battle for the heart. It's a God versus money. And sadly, in too many of believers' lives, money is winning out. My prayer for your people today is that we will do just that, trust and obey, and not place our hearts, our passions, our devotion in the things of this world, but only in our relationship with you. You recognize we cannot do this of our own, but it's only through the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, not by might nor by power, but by your Spirit. Bless us as we leave this place today. May we do so knowing that there's a debt we will never be able to repay because there's a God who loves us more than we can think, ask, or imagine. Now keep us, dear God, until we're together again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.